am I audible at the back? All right, perfect. Uh, <coughs> okay, so I'm here. I'm Shubra. Um, I run product marketing at Influx, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the beta that we recently launched. I'll promise not to kill you with a thousand slides. I just have five. Um, so before we get started, has anybody actually downloaded and tried this out yet? No. Okay. Um, I'm going to do some live configuration. If things blow up, don't kill me. I'm so just the messenger. <laughs> no, beta, you, it's a free trial okay, for a month. Yeah. How long is the trial? 30 days? Uh, it's 30 days right now. All right. So <clears throat> just a little bit, um, I'll focus on a few topics. So what the beta delivered uh, was obviously clustering. That was the big bang uh, feature that it delivered. But it also brought in a lot of nice features like managing your queries, particularly long running ones, uh, monitoring the database instances, your data nodes, your meta nodes, uh, getting the overall uh, handle on your cluster health itself. So to take a look at that, what I'm going to do is show you a dashboard Okay. So if you look at the overview screen, let's start here, right? What you're looking at is aggregate level cluster statistics. And when you're looking at active queries, for example, these are all the active queries running across all the data nodes in a cluster, right? You're actually writing data to uh, you know, one or many data nodes in the cluster. And what are those data nodes, right? So if you look at information here, these are essentially the data nodes. Uh, obviously, there are certain active queries, disk used, and active writes types, uh, performance metrics per node. So as you can see here, I have a two data node cluster. Uh, and I'm using three meta nodes. Uh, what do the meta nodes do? Um, essentially, they store the state of the cluster in terms of what are what their roles, what are they handling, what are the shards they're handling, right? Uh, which queries are they handling? So the essential persistent state of the cluster is managed by the meta nodes. Why do I have so many of them? Um, actually, I don't need them. <laughs> I can get away with a single day meta node, right? Um, this is essentially if you start getting too uh, highly available environment and you want to even get further, uh, you can add you know, up to three meta nodes. That's kind of a recommended architecture. In terms of data nodes, uh, if you have two, the max you could go is dual, you know, essentially do dual replication of your data. If you really want to go beyond dual replication, you could essentially be adding three data nodes, right? Get triple replication of your data. Why would I do that? Um, as in a lot of big data architectures, makes your querying quicker because you have so many nodes where you can actually get those queries from. And those queries could be returned from any active node which has access to that data. So think about putting a virtual IP in front. And if you were going and querying most of these databases, you could be getting the query result from the first available data node, right? Uh, so I'm moving towards a very highly scalable infrastructure. There isn't a theoretical limit as to how many data nodes you can add to a cluster. So you can keep provisioning more and more data nodes. If you look at the miscellaneous stats, obviously there will be a lot of improvements here and we are open to feedback. These are essentially aggregate level metrics, health metrics in terms of you know, garbage collection or the bytes allocated memory used uh, for that entire cluster. But before you get here, right, I just wanted to give you a snapshot view. How do you actually set up, start you know, building a cluster? So what I'm going to do, um, is I have spun up some uh, images on DigitalOcean. Uh, you could spin up AWS. I'll show you both on AWS as well. So here you can see I have three nodes that I have set up, a Meta 01, a Data 01, a Web UI 01, right? So these are three main components. One is the data node where the actual uh, data will be persisted, the meta nodes where the state will be managed, and the third one where the web console runs and manages and orchestrates the entire cluster, right? So Going back here, what I'm going to do is, okay. So you can see here, I hope this is legible. This is essentially my meta node. 
And if I look at this, I've already got the binary package. And these packages are available. You can get them through the documentation. It's just uh, of an Amazon S3 bucket. So what I'm going to do is first do a depackaging. Okay. So as soon as you do that, it's essentially installing the binaries of uh, the metadata server. And it's also going and modifying your system commands, adding a service to that, right? Uh, one key factor when you're configuring this is your hosts file. So if I look at host file, you can see that I have already added the mapping of the host to the IP addresses because this is a privately networked cloud environment. The physical IPs that I am accessing over are not exposed. So these boxes need to talk to each other. What ports do you care about? There are two key ports that you uh, should be aware of. Um, communication between the meta and the data nodes usually happens on port 8091 and uh, 8088, sorry. <laughs> and the communication between the meta nodes themselves happen over port 8091. So at least those ports should be open, right? So I've added those entries into my host file. Now, a key step here is setting up the configuration. The installation is done. So if you look at at C, influx. So you can see here there's a configuration file. And the first thing that you would put in here, you could start with an IP address, but well, I'll actually put on the real host name because I have that IP added. And I'm gonna say meetup space meta space zero one. Okay, that's my host name. And this is where you will actually lead a license key or a license uh, file. So I have a license file here, which I'm going to quickly spin up. So when you actually access the beta, you will actually get a license key, just like that. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to add that license key. And if you actually are behind a firewall network, you can get a physical key, right? Uh, and you can give the path to that key. Rest, you don't actually have to change much. These bind addresses and the ports are pretty much default, right? Um, and what I'm going to do is just save this configuration. For the data node, um, and actually before I go to the data node, let's see if I can start this service up, right? So you can do it saying service, influx, db, meta, start. Let's see. And saying it's running, it started. Let's check the status of this. Okay, so what I just did is just set up a simple meta node, right? But when you set up a meta node, those could also be operating in a cluster of themselves. I could have multiple meta nodes, right? So what I can do is um, I have a command that is exposed here, uh, which is called influx d control, right? And in this, you have a variety of cluster management commands at the CLI level, and there are APIs for these which will be uh, available. Uh, but if you want to join a meta node cluster, you'll essentially be issuing this join command. So what I'll say is influx D, CTL, join, and in my case, this server name is meetup uh, dash meta dash zero one and the port should be 8091, right? Let's do that. Okay, there you go, right? So I have just added, now if I see the output of this, I can see that I have in my cluster a registered node as a meta node. The data nodes is still empty, right? There's any data node set up yet. So let's go do the data node setup. I have the binary for this as well. Similar procedure, I have the host name already configured. And in this configuration file, I'll go ahead and ask these host names, add this host name. And in this case, I'll be meetup dash data dash zero one. Okay. There are different authentication schemes, you know, you can actually enable TLS authentication and so on. And I'll drop in the license key on this node as well. Um, right on. Okay, there you go. And there is a 
extra step um, in this one and that extra step is if you look at this one I have to add a shared secret and this shared secret is the way when you spin up the enterprise web console the shared the enterprise web console communicates to these data nodes and it uses that shared secret right so I'm just going to copy that and pop it into here and maybe there you go okay. you can keep you can modify it make it whatever you want okay now let's go ahead and spin this up and in this case my influx db uh, service is actually not influx db dash meta it's just influx db right so i'll just spin it up and let's check the status on this okay it's running now for connecting the meta nodes to the data nodes i would actually do that from the meta node console only one right and in this case what i'm going to do is if you look at this command in this one i was joining the cluster for meta but in this case i'm going to use a command called as add data so let's do this i'm going to say influx d control add a data node and i'm going to say the data node is meetup dash data dash zero one and this is eight eight okay So you see, so I have a minimalistic cluster. This is good enough, it will work, right? Um, but the only point is like I cannot replicate my data and you know, I don't have failover. So you can go and keep adding data nodes as you go along, right? Um, on the web side, uh, it's, there's an extra step here and uh, we are storing some of the information in a Postgres database. We'll be looking at supporting MySQL as well. Uh, just a pause, any concerns or are any opinion on Postgres versus MySQL? Um, what do you guys care about? All right, okay, cool. So, <laughs> that's good to know. Um, pardon? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going ahead and installing Postgres. Fairly quick. Okay, so that's done, and it's actually started it up, and you can see the version is uh, 9.3 of Postgres, right? And if I do a sudo dpkg, okay, it's pretty much the same. Um, the in configuration is a little bit different, though. Okay, so here, uh, there's a pretty URL. This is the URL that um, you know, your, your end users will be accessing, right, from outside. So you would like to keep this one as the public facing IP. Now this is on a cloud, so it's not going to be 127, 127. So I have a little cheat sheet to take a peek at, and I think my public IP is that guy. So I'm going to insert, and that's the default port. I'm going to run. Uh, obviously, you need to put in the license file here again, um, and the shared secret, right? This is where you see the shared secret. Now, one key block here to add is something called as the meta nodes that this enterprise web server is going to talk to. So it does not directly talk to the data nodes. It actually connects to the meta nodes and the meta nodes have the registration information of the data nodes and that's how it works, right? So in this case, you would go ahead and put the IP addresses and set this up, right? So you can go along and configure this. I wanted to give you the basic steps. If you want to go through the entire installation procedure, visit the docs, but let me show you a well-configured five node cluster that I have running right now. And that, by the way, is running on AWS. So let's get in here. Okay, so I'm going to refer to this node. So this is my AWS instance, and on this, if I type in the same command, you can see that this has two data nodes and three meta nodes, right? Um, so what we did was we had just three boxes, and we ran both the meta nodes and the data nodes on the same box. There are some resource constraints to be taken care of, 
the meta nodes are typically very lightweight. You can, if you're using it on AWS, T2 small is good enough, right? Um, you know, don't really need any processing power. 5, 1, 12 meg, 1 gig is more than what you would need. Um, the data nodes actually need to be a little beefier servers because that's where most of your data is going to reside, right? Um, so I normally go in, you know, there are different sizing parameters around that, uh, but if you're looking at a C2 XL large, um, you know, that would be a good starting point and you can scale up from there uh, on an AWS instance, right? Okay, so uh, we already have this, okay? So what I want to do is I showed you the basic setup step. Now, let me go back to my presentation. So you should be able to now hopefully get started setting up your cluster. Um, let's take a look at a few features other than the monitoring. So now that I have this actively running cluster, I am throwing some load, synthetic load at this, right? There is a script I'm running, goes and hits up all the three instances one by one, by one and I have some data here. So if you look at queries, this is probably one of the most interesting bits to look at. Uh, all of my queries are right now running in microseconds. Right? There's uh, not a slow running query. Hopefully during the phase uh, course of this demo, we will actually see a uh, slow running query pop up. Let's see. Okay, we'll, we'll give it the chance. So as soon as that slow running query pops up and it's actually a blocking query and you're not getting that to resolve, maybe somebody came in and said, hey, select star from CPU. Blah, blah, never do that, right? That's kind of a huge query. You're not defining any timelines, any boundaries along that condition, right? So your window is almost infinite. Since when you started logging data, that query would show up. In those cases, what you might do is actually go in and kill that query, right? And you can actually issue a kill query command at the back end, it will actually go and kill that query, okay? All right. From the database level uh, statistics perspective, you can actually see all your databases spread across all your cluster nodes. So here, you can see there are three databases. One of them is the internal database that we ship. Um, and obviously, you're seeing disk consumption, measurement, the number of series, and which users have access to those database instances, right? So there's some rule-based access control built in. Um, the most interesting bit is this one. So this one is a telegraph database. And not only do I have all that information, I can also see the continuous queries which are associated with that database instance. Uh, who knows what a continuous query is? Show of hands, you do. Okay, so the for folks who are not have not used this before, uh, it's a mechanism to get in-memory analytics. So you consume existing time series data, you do some computation on that data, there are some built-in functions, and you persist it back as another streaming metric. So when you query that, right, you actually get streaming analytics out of the database. And you can obviously plot that as well, right? So I set up two continuous queries here. Uh, one was essentially what I did was look at the CPU usage across all my machine, create a mean value. So mean is a built-in function. and. Um, what I did is I grouped it by time, right? So I said mean over X minutes, right? So I'm defining my window and I'm persisting it back into the database, right? And similarly, um, for I create another continuous query which actually looks at the free memory on every box and I'm doing mean. Mean may not be a right way to do this, but I'm saying monitor dot mean uh, memory uh, free. So memory dot free is the field, when I do an into, it's essentially a special character, um, and piping the results of my computation or my continuous query into that computed metric, right, or that analytic metric. Where can I see it? I'll show you when we go to the data explorer, okay? Okay, let's get back to our topics. Uh, cluster and data management. So you already saw a little bit of how you can add more data nodes, how you can manage the meta nodes in the cluster. You can actually force data nodes to leave the cluster, right? Uh, but what I'm going to show you is now a situation where, um, and that will be on our AWS instance. Uh, let's go here. Okay. So in this case, I can only say I have two data nodes, but if I look at the service, I have a third data node which is running on the same box as the meta box, right? 
So what I'm going to do is add this additional data node into the cluster, right? And we'll see some fun going on there. But before I add it, let's take a look at what we call as retention policies. So if you're looking at these databases, let's make the screen a little smaller. Um, if you look at this internal database, you can see that there are a number of shards and shards are our way of partitioning data and you know rolling them over. So you can have your own shard duration based on the retention policy that you set, right? You could have shards which are one hour long, one week, day long, a week long, you, the, you know, based on what you like. Now, you can see that the shard ID one um, is only present on that one data node, right? In this case, I was replicating the data twice, right? So my shard ID two is actually present on two data nodes, right? I put in triple replication in this case and was having the shard across three data nodes. Then I took away one shard, uh, a node from the cluster. So I'm down to two, right, two each. So what happens if I go ahead and add? Now, one key thing to node is, note is look at the sizes of the disk usage data on the node. So if you look at the bottom one, shard 61 or maybe shard 58, they're exactly the same, right? However, if you look at shard 53, um, the bottom two nodes are the same. The first one is different. Um, can anybody tell me why that could happen? Any clue? Yes, I did. So what was happening is I essentially, I was only having a single node uh, data persistence at point of time. And then I essentially added two more data nodes to the cluster and I changed the retention policy on that, right? However, when you do that, only new data rights that are coming in uh, get in there. What I did not do is copy over the historical data uh, from this node across to the other two additional nodes, right? So this is a newer data and this has everything, right? Um, replicated for all the new data. And coming in, right? Now, um, as part of beta two, uh, we will be launching a rebalance button, <laughs> which is going to be on the UI. So you won't have to go around, you know, copying shards. You can do that all from the CLI and using the API today, uh, but we will have that on the UI itself, right? However, if I wanted to get rid of a shard from here, right? Maybe I don't need this anymore. I can go ahead and get rid of it. But just to make sure that you're not fat fingering it, just confirm, I'm gone, right? So I blew away that shard from that particular server itself, right? So let's go ahead on to our console. And in this case, I'm going to say in flux B, CTL, add data. And in this case, I'm say ENT, RPM dash one port eighty eighty eight. Okay. Okay. So now I have. Uh, let's see if this screen is visible here. Okay. So I have added these. Um, but the, look at the IDs, right? I have the number five, six, and eight. Any clues why that could be <laughs> happening? Um, okay, so I've tried this a few times. I didn't want to come to this demo and have it fall over. <laughs> so what happened is I've been adding nodes and taking them away, but they are, the, anytime you add a node, it gets a tag, right? So, um, you know, right now when I started, I started with four, five, six, right? And took out four, then it became seven. Took that one out, now it became eight. Uh, a good enhancement feature uh, here would be audit trail. Like if you're logging and if you really want to look at, you know, what got spun up, what went away, you know, you're managing the overall infrastructure usage, that would be a cool thing to have, make sense? Okay, so now if we go back to our console, um, this will not kick in, right? There's nothing extra that's going on here. So how do I make it go from, see the results of my triple replication, right? I haven't done anything here yet. So what I'm going to do is if you open an InfluxDB client and if you type in show retention policies uh, on, let's say the instance telegraph, right? 
that was one of our database. And you can see that the replication level is two nodes, right? Uh, so what I can do is I can essentially say alter retention policy and the retention policy name in this case is monitor, right? And on say telegraph, right? I'll say uh, duration, let's say make it one hour and replication factor, let's say three. Let's confirm it. Okay. And if I issue the same command now, um, now I can see that my replication factor is three, right? However, this won't kick in. And if I want to sh make this demo a little exciting, uh, what I could be doing is look at influx D C T L. And there's a command here called as truncate shards, right? So any active shards that I'm processing, um, I can drop them, right? So any new shards that come in should be following this new policy and, you know, be triple replicated, right? So if I say influx D C T L truncate shards, shards done. If I say show shards, I have a number of these, but none of these are in flight. These are all historical shards. If I wanted to copy these shards over from one node to another, I can still do that, right? Now, if I go back to my console, and if I look at my overview pane, you can, do you see a third node here? We started with two, right? Now you have a third node. And as load trickle in, we essentially added this one, right? And you can see here the disk consumption is roughly half of the other two, right? Um, and if I look at my retention policies now, I have to give it a little bit of a time uh, for this to kick in. So we'll probably revisit this, uh, let it actually write some data, create a shard. But the next shard that you should have, maybe it's 62 or 63, should essentially be triple replicated again instead of dual replicated. Make sense? Okay. Uh, in respect of time, let me show you some more cool stuff. Okay, Data Explorer. I think this is the one that you would like the most. Uh, has anybody used Chronograph in the past? You have. Okay, so Chronograph was never, um, you know, a lot of people use that in conjunction or uh, along with Grafana. And from a dashboarding perspective, I think we will keep, we ourselves support Grafana on our hosting instances, right? We'll continue to promote that. Chronograph has taken a different route of its own. And Chronograph has essentially became what we call as a data explorer within the InfluxDB Enterprise console, right? So if you look at this, here's Chronograph for me. Um, so let's see uh, how this thing works. Oops, sorry. Okay, so how do we work with this data explorer, right? So what we do, you have this concept of a new session. Obviously, you can create a new session. I, this is my first one. And in, in this session, what I'm going to do is create a panel. And in this panel, I'm going to select a database. If I'm using Telegraph, uh, I'm hoping you are familiar with Telegraph. It's our telemetry agent solution, 75 plus plugins, gather data from everywhere, right? Um, so if you look at this, one of my friends um, has set up quite a few plugins, you know, pulling data from AWS CloudWatch, DNS queries, you know, cluster monitoring itself, the database stats, HTTPD stats, memory stats, you name it, right? Uh, there are some subscriber stats, NetStat, Postgres, and a bunch of others. You know, you can spin up Docker containers, pull metrics from there. So uh, let's start with basic memory stats, right, or CPU stats. And if I wanted to just look at system usage. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the interesting bit. All right, so you have, what you are looking at is a thing called fields. Now within fields, there are a variety of functions. Um, this is what differentiates 
a time series platform versus a general purpose database. All of these mathematical functions that you need for computation around mean, maxes, medians, averages, standard deviation spreads are pre-computed for you, right? So let's say in this case, I was selecting the median value, right? And I could go ahead and hit apply and not too much, maybe, yeah, it'll take a little bit. I think, yeah, I just started plotting the first data point here. Oh, yes, and where did I go? Uh, yeah, and let's group by, let's say 10 second data. Uh, hopefully that should come up or maybe one minute data. I'll wait off, uh, not too much. Maybe mean, take that off. Okay, there you go. Okay, now what I could also do is look at tags. And this is an aggregate level metric, right? This is a measurement. There are different fields in there, but I'm collecting across multiple hosts. Or in this case, I'm collecting across as many CPU processor threads you have running on that machine. So what I could do is essentially group by this CPU. And all of a sudden, you have metrics from all the nine CPU threads that are running on that system, right? Uh, or maybe group by the host itself. And in this case, you can see that I'm monitoring uh, three of my hosts, which is, uh, Alpha 1, Alpha 2, and Web. So these are three hosts where Telegraph is running. So I could be grouping by those host names as well. Or maybe create another panel for that, right? So you have all of these uh, key functionality built in. Now, other than that, what I also want to do is create another panel. Close this one out. And in this panel, uh, if you remember, we had created a couple of continuous queries, right? And I had promised you that I will show those to you. So if you look at this list, these are the two computed metrics, which was the mean CPU usage and the mean memory free that I had put as computed metrics. And if I look at this, you can see that this is my computed metrics. This is essentially continuous uh, queries or streaming analytics that I'm building. Very simplistic layman example. You can get really sophisticated with this, right? Um, so I think I make the point there. Okay. so. Um, Play around with this. There are a lot of features coming up even in this in terms of, you know, um, creating templates, you know, publishing these into a registry, uh, sharing across multiple teams in terms of collaboration of the data. Um, also from a dashboarding perspective, right? Um, one of the cool things here is you actually get the query from InfluxDB. So if you were a Grafana user, what you would do is pick up that query, stick it into Grafana, <laughs> and makes your life easier. Just a tip, right? Okay, um, finally, uh, a little bit about access control. So we have uh, users in here, and what you could do is actually invite a user, right? So let's say I'm gonna invite Paul Dix, who's a CTO, and uh, let's say paul at influxdb.com. There is an email server integration that I have not gone through. You can configure that so it actually sends you an invite mail, or you could actually set up a password for him invite that user, and then you can assign that user to a particular role. There are some built-in roles like admin and global admin, but you can create custom roles, right? When you are giving this access for a um, wider set of people across different teams, right? So let's say I give him global roles. So within the global admin, all of these uh, permission levels, including you know dropping databases, dropping the data, managing continuous queries, um, you know managing subscriptions or copying, sharding, or even rebalancing, right? If you say add Paul to this role, um, these permissions he already has access to, right? Or what if I went ahead and I created a role, right? And I'm calling it DevOps Engineer, right? Okay, so that's a role. And within DevOps Engineer, I can actually manage the role and give him a set of permissions, right? So within this, I can say, okay, these guys can actually just view chronograph, right? Because they are the consumers of this data. They don't need to be creating these. And it could be all the clusters. It could be any number of databases within the cluster and could say add the permission level. So that's done. And now when I go to a user and maybe I want to manage my own user ID and I want to add to role. So I can select DevOps engineer, add Shubra to that role. So now I am both a global admin and admin as well as a DevOps user. So you can do all kind of role-based access control. Um, right now these controls are set 
to the database instance, you know, what they can do within the database, um, you know, obviously you have seen the multiple permissions. Uh, further releases, you will get more and more granular in terms of tags or measurements that a particular user can control or can modify, right? If you really need that level of uh, role-based access control, but this is becoming a more of a uh, data sharing and a t uh, collaboration tool uh, with time series data, make sense? So with that being said, uh, I have one last slide to show you, and that will be, how do you get started? So to get started, all you need to do is hit up portal.influxdata.com, sign up, you will get a license key, you will get access to all the private documentation because we haven't done a GA release of this. Feel free to spin those up, it's a 30 day free trial and you know, knock yourself out. Give some good feedback, that's what we are looking for. Um, and, and obviously from our price, our pricing is also published there, we have made it very competitive so that it is useful for our community at large. Um, that's it from me, thank you.